Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, church seminar on uh, department leadership in the age of COVID. Uh, I want to acknowledge I'm just speaking here from Ottawa. Uh, my name is Jonathan Malloy uh, from Department of Political Science at Carleton University and I'm speaking on unceded Algonquin land. Um, I just want to welcome everyone here, particularly I do apologize for the technical move. Uh, the other platform I realized was insufficient and so we came up with a Zoom solution and looks like we got everyone over to Zoom. So uh, we have already have one success today. So thanks for bearing with us for that. Um, my main job is just to introduce uh, the, the panel and people that will be uh, talking today about department leadership. I mentioned my name is Jonathan Lloyd from Carleton University. Uh, we've got a, 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 a panel of four uh, great uh, department chairs or associate deans talking about department leadership. Uh, and the discussion is going to be facilitated by my colleague, Lillene Berdahl, uh, Executive Director of the Johnson Choyamba Graduate School of Public Policy at the Universities of Saskatchewan and Regina. I also say this is part of the, this is uh, sponsored by the University of Manitoba's Center for Higher Education uh, and Research Development, CHURD. Uh, this is part of CHURD's regular programming on academic leadership, uh, including a number of different courses and seminars and things, including the Academic Head Seminar that Lena and I uh, facilitate. I'm gonna talk more about that at the very end of uh, the webinar. Uh, but let me introduce the four panelists and then I will uh, stop talking. Uh, we have, I said four people, we have uh, Gus Hill. Gus is the Associate Dean of Indigenous Field of Study uh, for the Faculty of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, we have Kim Hellemans. Kim is the Chair of the Department of Neuroscience at my own institution of Carleton University. Uh, Danny Mann is the Head uh, on Lead this year of the Department of Biosystems Engineering from the University of Manitoba. And Kerry Roberts is the chair of the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies uh, at Mount Royal University. So the four of them will be sharing their many secrets about department leadership in the age of COVID or not. Uh, and it will be facilitated by Lillian Berdahl. So Lillian, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Excellent. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm Lillian Berdahl. And uh, as, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I'm at the, uh, the universities of Saskatchewan and Regina. I'm speaking to you today from Saskatoon. So I'm speaking from uh, Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homelands of the Métis and the University of Regina, which, of which I'm also affiliated is uh, in uh, Treaty 4 territory and the traditional lands of the Métis. And so we, we do pay uh, our respect to each other. Um, I am so excited to be here because uh, I, right now I'm executive director at a, a policy school, uh, but and I took on that position during a pandemic, which was fascinating. Uh, but uh, when uh, when the universities closed down, I was a department head of, of political studies at the University of Saskatchewan, and I know what it is like to uh, to do all these things on the fly. And so I'm very excited that we're going to be able to uh, to have this discussion today. The way we're going to uh, to structure it is uh, we want it to be a bit more organic. It's not going to be a panel of here's Carrie's thoughts. Now here comes Kim's thoughts and so on. Um, so I'm just going to throw questions to people. They're going to react uh, and we're just going to, uh, to move things along. Uh, as we do so, there is the chat function. So if you have your own thoughts, um, if you have your own reaction to the question I'm asking the, uh, the person I've tagged that you want to share, um, by all means do so. We really want this to be an opportunity uh, in part for a, a cathartic uh, sense of, of community amongst people as well as, as learning. Uh, sometimes it can be very valuable as a department chair or department head to have someone else say, yeah, me too. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. And uh, so we, we hope that there will be some, just some of that as well as some really practical tips. Um, so I'm actually going to start things off by throwing a question to Kim. So Kim, hopefully you're on the ready. And uh, my question for you has been, uh, what has been the most challenging part of leading your department during a global pandemic? Well, I think we could spend a whole hour talking about the challenges, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments as brief as possible. But I, I do want to emphasize the fact that I lead a department uh, in a STEM discipline. So one of the big challenges for my unit has been maintaining research productivity uh, throughout the various waves and periods where we haven't ha had the opportunity to be on campus uh, due to the, the, the limits um, of physical distancing uh, with COVID-19. So certainly that's been one of the, the challenges for me is, is trying to get these, um, these spaces ready and to ensure that we can have our graduate students engaging in their research and moving through their degree program in a meaningful way. 
Um, the other piece of that I would say is, is managing myself, right? And the challenge of managing my own um, responsibilities and duties at a time when I, I you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I have two young kids. I have a seven and a 10 year old, one just busted in, hello, trying to tell me a joke. Now is not the time, right? So uh, managing uh, life and, and feeling like um, I, I, I'm wearing my mom hat or my chair hat and nothing in between. And uh, when I'm at home, I tend to be wearing my mom hat or my wife hat, or, you know, I'm, I'm existing in this identity of uh, at home and now somehow it's, it's, it's blurred, right? So I just kind of feel like this identity shift and then feeling like no matter, um, even if I have time, I'm not being as productive in those times because I feel like I have um, confetti time, right? So these like 15 minute intervals um, because of various you know interruptions when my kids are at home. And then I would say also feeling this constant pivoting, right? This this change and adaptation through every period with the public health scenario and then the university has to adapt and develop new guidelines and it's just this feeling of constantly having to be nimble and then you just get adapted to one set of parameters and then you've got to adapt yet again so that has been a challenge and then the last thing I want to mention is this constant feeling of failure and loss right this this grief space that we're in and having to lead uh, at a time when I feel I'm not feeling the best, but I need to be maintain optimism. I need to keep inspiring. I need to keep putting on a brave face. And so this, this sense of not being true and authentic um, at a time where I'm, uh, you know, part of me wants to go, ah, you know, <laughs> but I can't, <laughs> right? We, we, as leaders, we need to keep going. And we, and that's what we've been appointed to do is to continue to, to guide the ship, uh, even through the, the most troubled waters. So that's, that's, you know, in a nutshell, a few of the major challenges I've had. <laughs> Thanks. So Carrie, you became department chair during all of this. So I believe you started July 1. What was that transition like? Well, hi everyone. Thanks, Lolene. I, um, I often tell people um, that I think it, in, in a way I got lucky. Like, of course there were challenges of, of, of taking on this role during COVID when we're all working from home. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the benefit is that unlike my colleagues, I did not have to pivot to remote teaching because I have a full course release this year as chair. And so if there were ever a great year to not be teaching, I would say this is it. But that, that brought some challenges as well because then of course I struggle a little bit to try to support my colleagues who were making the pivot and trying to adapt um, because you know it often gets pointed out to me, you know, well, Carrie, lucky you, you're not in the classroom. Yeah, you have a point there. Um, so so that, um, that has been interesting, but I would say um, another challenge as a new chair for me, we have a big department, it's multidisciplinary. We've got a whole um, justice and criminology program and then a policy studies program. And so um, coming into the role as chair, I didn't know because I'm a political scientist myself, I didn't know a lot of my justice studies colleagues. Um, and, and unfortunately, I still don't. One of the challenges I've had is connectivity, right? Is feeling, um, you know, like I am chair for all of them. And, and I think for them, feeling like I am their chair and that they can come to me and talk to me. And so I, I struggled a bit with figuring out how to get to know people um, I, that I probably should have known before I took this on. <laughs> um, but how do I do that, you know, other than setting up sort of one on one Zoom meetings and, and things like that? We did a little bit of that. Um, but sometimes that can feel a little bit stiff, a little bit contrived. It's not your average hallway conversation or go for coffee moment um, that I would have preferred. Um, so coming into a new, uh, to, to this role with a, a number of colleagues that I didn't know was a big challenge for me. Well, thank you. Gus, how, how have you managed connecting with your people and, and maintaining that connection and, and protecting their well-being during all of this? Uh, thank you, Lillian, uh, and greetings, everyone. Um, it's a very interesting question, and as the associate dean in my faculty, one of the uh, ideas that came to me some way, probably in discussion with other people, though I can't quite remember, um, that is to give credit, but not specificity because I don't remember. <laughs> um, my 
my role quickly became uh, one of uh, checking in on a, a regular basis with the different cohorts of students that we have in our faculty. And uh, I set a kind of a schedule of every two weeks, making sure that I had face time with every student. And the importance of that has become um, greater over time when in the pandemic. Um, and what we've been able to do is accommodate schedules. So it's not all cohort check-ins, though that is what we call them. Sometimes it's individual check-ins with individual students or a group of students who are struggling with a particular issue. Uh, we've encountered, because we're dealing with humans, we've encountered a lot of grief and loss around family members passing, pets passing, and that is meaningful, um, not only as a pet owner, but you know, as a human being, understanding that uh, pets are part, parts of our family. Um, but also addictions, um, a lot of mental health struggles, a lot of emotional health struggles. And so within my program as an Indigenous program, we, we speak in terms of holism and we look at, we use a medicine wheel as uh, foundational to our, our guiding um, pedagogy, but also our evaluation and just our way of being. And so we're constantly looking at spiritual concerns emotional, mental, physical concerns, and trying to hear what what the, the struggles are, trying at times to be a firefighter, putting out fires, um, but also being a strategist um, and being a politician and uh, performing many duties. Um, I think the, the key has been that I need to keep track of my students and there are hundreds of students um, because it's so easy to, it would be easy for me to retreat and as, as Kim shared, um, just go, I've had enough and throw my arms up um, given my own holistic wellness uh, struggles. Um, but as Kim shared, I simply can't. And I have an ethical responsibility, um, not just as an associate dean administrator in the institution who looks after and cares for um, staff, faculty, and students, with students being the ultimate priority, but also as a social worker, I'm bound by an ethical code. So I have to, uh, I have to keep track of, of people's holistic wellness and, and do what I can and we started with the very tangible needs of students um, and it, it quickly shifted. And I, I'm proud of my institution that we've done a reasonable job of attending to tangible needs. Um, so we dispersed rocket sticks um, so that students could connect over Zoom and attend classes. And we have a lot of students in remote communities where uh, internet is, is sketchy at best. Um, and then we, you know, we distributed laptops and we distributed Chromebooks where we couldn't, you know, where our laptop supply ran out and, and just a lot of printers and all kinds of stuff. Um, so very tangible, um, equipment based needs, but also, um, extra scholarships and so on, uh, bursaries to address financial need. It didn't take very long for those needs to shift into the intangible and that's where it became about emotional and mental health um, and that's where these check-ins became really really important and they're not time limited uh, per se i try to keep them within about two hours per meeting um, but it has it has become the focal point of my role as associate dean is to make sure that people are doing well and i do that with students so we're talking hundreds of students but also with my staff and also with my um my colleagues uh, who are also associate deans um, 
who are new to the, the role, so similar to Carrie. So I, I am, I'm departing uh, the role as of July one, um, but last July, similar to Carrie, the, I had two new associate deans join the administrative ranks, and in a pandemic, just struggling, um, and so being available to them and attending to their their questions, which were numerous. Um, and also, th it might sound it might sound surprising, um, but to some, maybe not others, um, attending to my dean as well. Um, as a, a trained mental health clinician, um, you know, attending to my dean strategically helps me do my job better um, and with less interruption, uh, just maintaining open communication, but also my dean is not from my discipline. So it's similar to what, what Carrie was sharing. My dean has struggled um, over the term of, of her um, appointment as dean to really understand the profession of social work and um, and get a grip on, on what social workers are like. And we can be very challenging people for any of you who have colleagues or friends who are social workers or family members for that matter or indeed our social workers, we can be very challenging people. Um, and that's been really, really tough for my dean. Uh, so without making it all very public and so on, attending to my dean on a regular basis to make sure that, that she feels supported, that, and I, I have to regularly say, or have to is strong language, but I've chosen to regularly say, I'm here to serve your office. So I need to know how I can help you. and I. I'm here to listen. And so there's been a lot of, it feels like I'm a counselor again um, at times, um, most of the time, in fact, um, all the while carrying a course load and um, and trying to maintain a, a program of research and, and so on. But the check-ins have been so powerful, um, even being feeling seen, feeling heard, is very powerful. So that would be my advice. Um, as regularly as you possibly can, schedule um, just informal check-ins, maybe guided by a question um, to create some structure, but um, an opportunity for students to share what they're going through. And that sharing goes some way to alleviating some of the, the holistic stress they're under. Um, and then essentially facilitating um, peer counseling. Um, so I don't always have all the answers, but some of their peers very much do. And um, I believe in the the strength and power of, of people and what they bring to, uh, to their roles as students. So they're not just, you know, sponges or empty voids. They have life experience. Certainly in social work, a lot of our students come after having careers, uh, come back to grad school. And so, you know, there, I don't need to have all the answers and um, yeah, creating the safe space for them to share is, is really important. And it helps me. I have actually um, a checklist of people I've seen and people I haven't seen or heard from and um, we have had a death. We have had some people slipping through the cracks who have withdrawn from the program and, you know, carrying the, a bit of guilt about that. Um, but knowing that I did what I can do, uh, short of going to their house and knocking on the door. Um, but they just didn't, they didn't attend and they, they did slip through the cracks. So also, um, for me, ethically, putting forth that effort. Um, so I, ba I basically have one or two check-ins each week with full cohorts and then additional meetings with students and student groups and additional meetings with staff, additional meetings with faculty, additional meetings with my dean um, and vice presidents, to be honest, um, who are new to the institution and um, are also struggling with uh, or grappling with what does indigeneity mean at the institution and um, being one of the senior indigenous scholars at, at my institution, it's, um, 
it's been it's been a, a heavy lift for a while but knowing that i've done everything i can um helps a little bit in in dealing with the uh the grief and the um my grief personal grief about um losing some students whatever that might mean so yeah thank you much, Holly. well thank you gus that's uh there was there was a lot in there and a couple of points i'd like to uh, to pick up on is um is is the importance of of connecting with with people and 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 reaching out and that that plays a role not only for them but for for you individually as a as a leader to to know that uh, that you've done that um i'd be curious for everyone listening and danny you should be on note i'm going to call on you next but uh for everyone listening um if you've used uh, check-ins with with students or faculty uh, if that's been a strategy that you found quite effective, if you could throw that into the chat, I think other people would love to hear from that. Danny, I'd like to pick up on one of the points um, that uh, that Gus mentioned in terms of uh, concerns with respect to uh, with respect to mental health. Um, and so Gus is a social worker and he's trained to do this. Um, most of us have uh, little or no training in in mental health support and our faculty are are in the same boat and uh, you know they're dealing with uh, with students and um, and uh, and and researchers who are experiencing this have you uh, have you found uh, that that faculty are expressing stress with uh, with dealing with with mental health demands from their students or or personally and and what have you done on that front to or, or do you have any suggestions on what people can do on that front to to help support their team um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll preface, preface my um, comments, I guess, with the fact that I am, I was, uh, was department head uh, when the pandemic hit until, until July 1st, and, and I've, I've been on sabbatical, um, you know, for the past nine months, and, you know, we'll be heading back into, you um, you know, the being the head of the department um, on July 1st again. So, I mean, my, again, I, I was on the front line, so to speak, uh, right at the beginning when, you know, when those, those first decisions were made that uh, we're going to shut down the university, we're going to transition to remote learning for the next two weeks, you know, to finish off the semester and, and you know all of the, all of those, the uncertainty in those those early days, um, and you know the, I was I was teaching courses at that at that time too, and and so you were you were balancing I, I suppose you know trying to figure out what was going to be the the best solution. Uh, for the students to to get them through the end of that semester, you know, through the final presentations or exam week and so forth, and and also the challenge that that I knew all the all the instructors were facing as they were, you know, at the University of Manitoba, uh, the decision was made on a Friday that we were we were going to transition to uh, remote learning. Um, classes were canceled Monday and Tuesday the following week with the assumption but that by Wednesday we would all have figured out how to transition to finish our course off remotely and I mean that was a most ridiculous statement that could have ever been made by by anyone that we would figure it out in two days I mean we we did I mean we we came up with a way to finish the semester but we certainly didn't figure it out um, and I think what I realized over over those you know those next months as as you know we we go from putting out one fire to the next, and what I realized was that it was it was really important to try to keep you know the staff members in in the light as um, in the know as much as possible. I mean, there, there was, there's all kinds of uh, things that were happening in the background and decisions that were making and being made and, 
and ideas that were being being talked about. But if and you know there were there was speculation that there was going to be people laid off and budget cuts and you know all of that that stress and and I just felt that you know not just the academic staff but the you know the technic the technical support staff the office support staff I mean they were dealing with with all of that type of of stress not knowing whether whether they were going to be laid off and and I just you know made it a point of of trying to um, have some regular meetings and and be as open and upfront with people as I mean I obviously I mean I'm just a department head I didn't know very much of what was going on but I knew more than they did and you know I just tried to be that that conduit of of um, information and and keep them as informed as much as possible the um, in terms of of my own uh, well being. Um, I, I felt particularly um, stressed at times because of the, the unique situation of, of our department. We, we formally belong to two faculties. So from a budget perspective, we belong to the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, but from a, a curriculum perspective, we belong to the Faculty of Engineering. And so, in those, I mean, those of you that were, you know, remember back to 13 months ago, um, and in the months following, everyone was was struggling to figure out, you know, what procedures do we have to put in place if we want to consider getting grad students back into the lab, or what processes do we have to put in place to deliver our classes and and so forth, and. None of those decisions were were being made at at the university level, and and you know we weren't simply being told what to do. Faculties individually were expected to come up with their game plan, and so I was attending two sets of executive meetings: one in agriculture and one in engineering, and they weren't going in the same directions. They're different ideas, different processes, and because our department straddled the two, there were days where I had really no idea what, <laughs> what that meant for us. You know, how do we, how do we follow both of these sets of rules and, and sets of processes and whatnot. And I mean, the, the one day when, when I simply had got to the point where I had had enough, I'd been in a, you know, in some email exchanges with about some of the forms that we had to, you know, our, and professors had to get filled out in order to get permission for grad students to get back into the labs and and I was getting I was the I was the middleman I was take collecting these from the academic staff forwarding these up to the dean's office and getting feedback and trying to m manipulate this whole process and I I got to the point one day where okay this is enough I shut down my computer I got in my car and I went for a drive <laughs> and you know, the, the, the other option was that I would have sent an email that I would have regretted and <laughs> potentially, and, and I just needed to, you know, to, to get out and, and uh, you know, clear my head and, and take that, that opportunity. So, you know, that, that was a personal, a personal uh, experience that I had, for sure. I don't know if I really answered your question, but... <laughs> No, you, you did. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that, Danny. And I can say for myself, I'm a runner. I don't know how I would have survived this past year without without running. It just has uh, has been something where um, I, you, you mentioned sort of shutting the computer and, and driving off. Um, sometimes I have, I get sort of really uh, unhappy. Usually it has, involves an email, like you said, and, uh, and a good strategy can be to, uh, to get out and not respond uh, immediately. So Carrie, I'd like you to imagine that you have a, a special time machine and you can go back to, uh, to the start of your, your time as, as department chair. And we understand you started in the middle of the pandemic and you now know what you know um, about how things are going to progress. Would that change anything that you do or would it give you more peace of mind, less peace of mind? Would you get in this time machine? 
Um, I mean, the honest answer, Lolene, is I'm not sure it would make a difference. I, I, I don't know if others have felt that, you know, there's very little control to be had in the time of COVID. So I'm not sure, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and like sometimes I often find myself saying this year, you know, to people, well, you either laugh or you cry. And I'm going with laugh because I don't want to go down that other road, right? And so, you know, for me, just trying to find the humor in situations. And I mean, so I'm, I'm coming to you this morning from Alberta. So not only have we had COVID to grapple with, but we've had extreme budget cuts uh, across post-secondary in our province. And so had I known before I took on the role, just what that, that budget slashing was going to look like, um, you know, I may have thought differently about <laughs> the, the role. Um, I'm not sure there's anything I could have done to change anything though. Um, you know, if I had a time, I mean, small things, I think, um, if I had known. One of the things I learned that would have been nice to know initially was just how little of the email I send out to my colleagues and students actually gets read. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the things I've learned over time, and unfortunately things fell through the gaps because I didn't learn it quickly enough. Um, but one of the things I've learned over time is to, um, you know, one sentence out of every email can be bolded. And that's like the thesis of the email. And I've taken to, to bolding that every time so that, you know, for the scanners, or the ones that aren't even really scanning in, they're just looking for the, and, and so because that's become a thing now that I do, I feel like people can come to expect that. So <laughs> if you need to figure out what's really going on, just go to the bolded and type, um, you know, here's what you need to do. Here's your action item. And, and so I guess I just always thought, I mean, I don't know, nerd alert, uh, maybe this is why I wanted to be chair, but I'm the sort of person who reads all that email that I get, you know, from senior admin. I read the details, I care about that stuff. And I just assumed so did everyone else. Well, that is not the case. Um, and, and, and so there's, there's that piece. I think also one of the things, um, one of my first tasks when I started was we had to do a bit of a scramble and do some contract faculty hiring for the fall semester. Um, and um, I, I learned, people told me, but it didn't sink in. I wish I had listened. Oh, I had a nickel for every time I said that. Um, I would have spent the summer memorizing my collective agreement um, because, because that's one of the things I realized I, I, you know, and here I had worked for 12 years uh, under this collective agreement. I had no idea what was in there, you know, other than I know when I'm getting paid and I know, you know, sabbatical rules. That was all I ever paid attention to. So suddenly I was dealing with all of these employment conditions and, and deadlines in particular, the dates by which things were due, um, you know, handling tenure commit tenure processes and these sorts of things. And so I think I, I mean, I've learned it, you figure it out, but I think I, I could have made better use of my early days as chair, getting more comfortable with some of those, those processes and things. Um, that's probably, maybe I'll add one more, and that is, um, I also wish I had listened, Lolene, I think you're one of the people that, that talks about this on, on Twitter and I've seen others talk about it. The, the importance of not letting your email inbox be your to-do list. Um, and I, I heard that, but those things fell on my deaf ears because that is how I rolled for the first several months is just sort of that, that's what controlled my day is what came in, you know, at 7.30 in the morning when I sat down and looked at my email. And I'm, that feeling of not being in control of one's day uh, was not, as a new chair, is not something I was comfortable with. I mean, when you're teaching, you're just on your own. As long as you're showing up to class, no one really cares what you're doing. Um, and now suddenly I was not on my own. And if I had something that needed to get done, a writing deadline, um, I felt like I was not in control of that. And so um, I'm getting better, but uh, I think I, I, so if I had a time machine, um, I would have gone back and listened to the very good advice that I received, but didn't take. <laughs> Excellent. Kim, was there any good advice that uh, that you received that you that you didn't take, or is there any good advice that you give that you don't take yourself that you are willing to share? Uh, I I wasn't ready for that. I was ready for the advice that I I was given and I have been taken. And one of those pieces you can share that too. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share that. It is when Jonathan um, John Sutton retired from his chairship, stepped down. 
uh, he had a top 10 list on Twitter of, of things that he lessons learned. And one of them, uh, two of them actually really resonated with me. And one of them was respond, don't react. And that has, one, that has been a piece of advice that's been invaluable, particularly during this pandemic. And what it says to me is, you know, when I think about as a scientist and a neuroscientist, reaction is, is our lizard brain. It's, 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 it's responding with emotion. And so often as chairs, we, we get things in our inbox and Carrie, tell me the secret of not using my email as a, as a to-do list, please share me your ways. Um, uh, but you get these things, right? And, and they can be inflammatory um, and it's our instinct to sort of have at it right away, right? Because we're sitting with this uncomfortable emotion and it's really, really hard, right? And, and to step away from that take some breaths and, and a response is something that involves the prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain that thinks logically, it inhibits those negative emotions. And, and we can actually formulate something that's a little bit more problem solving as opposed to problem generating and problem co um, continuation, right? And particularly in the last year, uh, we're seeing so much more emotions. Gus Rift on this, right? The, the, the emotional space is so pr ever present. And as, as chairs and academic leaders, you know, it, it's part of our responsibility to, to manage this space. And I think taking deep breaths, like not firing off that email that we, our lizard brain wants to send off right away has been uh, very incredibly valuable during, during this time. And the other piece of advice is don't forget about your students. And, uh, you know, that's one that I have struggled with. And, you know, John in indicated this as one of his top tens. And I've tried to keep that in the back of my head. I'm a teaching faculty. So my, my main role is, is, a, is a teacher. And um, it's been hard. It's been really hard to keep my students front and center, particularly because at times they are perceived as more needy. Right. And, you know, I've, I, last semester I, in the fall, I taught a first year class, 600 students, 13 TAs. Um, managing a department in a global pandemic, I really wish I hadn't done that. I, you know, I it was I was speaking with my ego. The students need me. This is really important. I should be teaching these students. It wasn't teaching. It was pressing play to hit a Netflix style release of my lectures and dealing with a lot of problems that I wasn't in in a good enough space to deal with. And so um, I I wish I had listened to people so there's the advice as well to say you shouldn't be teaching right now no 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 i can do it right totally it's totally different to be teaching in a pandemic versus teaching in the last two years of my chairship i've been able to manage it and and, and thrived loved being in the classroom with my students this year i just really didn't feel i had all i could give to my students because frankly i did have to privilege my my departmental members my graduate students in my unit as well to to almost a greater extent because their 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 livelihood their careers were being uh, very much impacted and in, and in, in, in my face so yeah I guess those are the, the the piece of advice I took the piece of advice I kind of took and I probably a piece of advice I really should have taken is is maybe now is not the time for me to be teaching in spite of how much I love it it it, it was draining me more than it was giving back this year thank you Kim so Danny. What are you still on the time machine side, but uh, switching a little bit? What are you glad that you did not know? Like, what are what are you like? If you went back in the time machine, what would you deliberately not tell yourself just to to make things manageable? Well, I think that, and and it probably applies to all of us in in just in our general lives. I mean, if if we would have known that it was going to extend, the pandemic was going to extend this long. I think that's the part that I, it's, it's really tough. I mean, I, I think that going back to those original conversations that, that took place within, within our, our department with our, with our staff, I mean, we, we first thought, okay, well, we've got to figure out a way to teach classes online over the summer. And then people said, well, by the fall, we're for sure going to be back in, in person. And, you know, the, then it transitioned to, well, okay, yeah, the fall semester is going to be in person, but for sure by the winter we'll be back. And, you know, that, that constant pushing of the, of the, of the deadline is, 
is I think what's been the most um, difficult to get to get your your head around. And you know, it's it's one thing if it, you can plan how to cope if you think it's going to be for you know a, a set period of time. But if the time keeps changing on you, that's that's when it gets to be to be challenging. And you know. Again, I've been I've been uh, on sabbatical these past nine months, so I haven't been on the front line of all of these executive meetings. But my acting head has you know has me on speed dial, um, knowing that you know and my sabbatical is in my my living room here in my home office, so he he knows I'm not far away. Um, and as we've been now planning for the upcoming academic year, I was again thinking, you know, that everyone's going to be excited about the possibility. The University of Manitoba had announced that it was going to be a, a transition back to in-person learning in the fall. And I had been working with our acting head to come up with, you know, what did that mean um, for, for our, you know, our department, our you know, the graduate and undergraduate courses that we taught. And I thought I'd come up with was, you know, a reasonably good strategy, a good balance that would allow, you know, our smaller graduate courses to proceed in person and our undergraduate classes, you know, to continue in a remote fashion with bringing students back into the labs um, to get back to that hands-on experiential component that we've all felt was so important and we had a meeting with our our teaching staff uh, just a couple of weeks ago and I was just kind of blown away when it was pretty much unanimous that um, everyone felt completely comfortable just continuing on remote um, for the fall and you know I guess what what I had failed to take into account is, is the, the anxiety, the, the fear of that we, we are all going to face as we transition back out of the pandemic. And, and that's, I, I suppose, what um, I didn't anticipate. I thought that, um, that it was, that we would all just naturally want to return back to the way things were and that it would just sort of happen instantaneously. But now I'm starting to realize that that transition out of the pandemic, when whenever it in fact does happen, is probably going to be almost as traumatic as the transition into the pandemic was. And, you know, exactly what that means, you know, as, you know, as, as department heads, you know, we're still going to find that out. So, um, you know, again, in terms of of not knowing, I, I I certainly didn't anticipate this type of 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 change in the way people um, looked at things. Just again, knowing that just a few months ago, people were still thinking, well, how can we make in person learning work? And now it's th their mindset has completely changed. And how you know, let's just continue remote. We figured out how to do it. Let's. Let's do it again, and and you know, I, I I think the underlying assumption is once we're once we know that it's completely safe to go back to in person, then we'll be happy to do that. But until then, um, let's just stick with what we've now figured out as as an interim solution. You you raised some great points there, Danny, and uh, I've heard some people say that uh, that the transition off campus is going to look like it was super easy compared to the transition back onto campus. And, and I think we're going to see those challenges ahead. So I'm conscious of the time here. So I'm going to throw one last question to, uh, to Gus. Gus, what lessons uh, will you take from this that, uh, that you'll be taking forward? And then I'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Uh, the, the biggest lesson, and this won't surprise anyone, <laughs> understand that I'm a social worker. Um, but the biggest lesson in academia for me has been, in this pandemic, has been people first. Um, quite simply, um, I, have, um, I have positioned students in the forefront of my everyday. 
Um, and in order, I attend to students, then I attend to uh, staff because they run the institution. <laughs> then I attend to um, my co-administrators, then I attend to my faculty. Um, and of course, based on need, but uh, people first. So I put in the chat that I fully intend to, I won't be the associate dean, but I will be, um, I have been mentoring my successor um, and using a lot of what uh, Lolene and Jonathan shared in the, the workshop um, with uh, with my, my coworker who's in my department and will be taking over as of July 1. Uh, a lot of the attention to students pays off in the long run. Um, so I, where my colleagues have not necessarily attended to their cohorts of students quite as, as diligently, uh, that's not a criticism, but they are facing greater um, problems, I, for lack of a better word. Uh, their, their student struggles are greater. They're, they seem to be magnified because they haven't, they're not tiny fires anymore. They're big blazes now. And um, students are burning out, faculty are burning out, staff are burning out. Um, the other piece being, um, if I had a piece of advice other than you know, people first and attending to students via check-ins, it would be um, attend to your holistic wellness diligently along the lines of what uh, Lillian said about, you know, being a runner. Um, I tend to be a gym rat, so I really put a lot of time into my physical wellness. Um, but also, I, you know, being a holistic person, I also attend the ceremonies where, you know, and I use medicines and I consult with elders and sit with elders and, and um, try to do that. And one of the ways that I've had to um, adapt is office hours don't really exist anymore. Um, 9 to 4.30 is... Uh, a thing of the past, at least for the foreseeable future. So I have taken to taking a day off. And I know that might sound absolutely ridiculous because I too am, I am, I, my days are dictated by my inbox, uh, usually starting at 5.30 in the morning. Um, because I, for whatever reason, my new vice president, that's when this guy wants to communicate. Um, uh, so, uh, and he wants to meet between seven and nine. Uh, it's not, that's not my, that's sleep time still for me. So, um, but I have, uh, advised everybody, I'm just taking the day off and I'm not responding to email and you won't be able to reach me because unless you come to my door and I'm not going to answer my door anyway, um, you're not going to be able to reach me. I'm not going to be reachable. And what is perhaps of greater importance is not then filling my time with watching videos or television or movies or anything to do with screens. Um, reading a book is a stretch. Um, often it's um, doing some gardening or yard work or attending to um, stuff around the house that needs to be done, like renovations or small renovations or small uh, maintenance things. But in all of that, realizing that I am also human and that I'm not Superman and that I, w I, I have been um, at points, it's ebbed and flowed where I've been burned out and some weeks are better than other weeks. Uh, but what I think this is probably a common experience, but it is certainly my experience. Um, in person, probably five hours of my day were taken up by people leaning in my doorway and saying, can I have a minute? I have a quick question. I've learned there are no quick questions. Mm -hmm. And I started to uh, set a timer. So you ask for a minute, here's the timer, go. And being, being more intentional about protecting my time. And I, I heard that a lot from Lolene and Jonathan about um, building in margins. So I, I, 
have tried really, really hard to do that. And it's really, really hard to do. <laughs> so I'm still learning to do that. But yeah, taking, taking time off and um, just dealing with the guilt of doing so. Um, I'm, I'm not pretending that I don't feel guilty in taking time off, knowing that my email inbox is just filling, um, but doing it anyway. Uh, because if I don't do it, no one else is going to protect my time and no one else is going to take care of my holistic wellness. So that's that would a, be my advice. Just do it and deal with the guilt. <laughs> if it's a half day, if it's a full day, if uh, what I learned was I no longer get long weekends. And that's been five years. Um, I haven't had a long weekend. And my vacations are always cut short. Um, so being more planful and, and taking Lolene and Jonathan's advice about building in the margins and protecting your time and um, privileging your time. So I have to privilege my time. And I shared before, um, not in this meeting, but uh, I managed, I don't know how, but I managed to uh, put out a book this year, which okay. seems absolutely ridiculous to me that I, I managed to do that. But it was because I had built in time where I closed my email program. I shut off notifications. I turned off my iPhone, actually turned it off, not just silenced it or anything. And I was able to um, chip away at, at some uh, scholarly work that I've really been, <laughs> like all of us, meaning to do. <laughs> so that would be, that, those would be my uh, my offers which that, that's really inspirational gus and i i'm a big believer in the chipping away point so i'm glad it uh, it went so well for you so jonathan i'm going to turn things back to you okay all right thanks thanks Lily, and thanks to all our participants for some great contributions here and also the chat and following along the chat and having people kind of talk that's uh that's really great as as well and uh that um so i just uh, i just have a couple of quick closing remarks i know people have places to go more zoom meetings to do Hopefully no vice presidential messages at 5.30 this morning, but we'll see. Um, I do want to just uh, thank uh, the University of Manitoba for, for hosting this, particularly Tara DeCastro, who uh, successfully managed us to Zoom here like that. And I did want to mention, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as Gus sort of uh, mentioned a couple times there as well, uh, this is part of a series that uh, the Center for Higher Education and Research education research development at Manitoba uh, does offer, including a workshop on academic leadership that Lene and I uh, offer regularly. I see several alumni uh, are, in, are in the audience here today. Uh, and that is being run again uh, in, in June. There'll be information shortly about signing up for that. So if you are considering uh, either, if you're either a current department head or associate dean, or you're about to become one, uh, you might find the workshop very useful and uh, you can learn more about that. We'd love to see you again uh, in June on that. Uh, so I think that's all our closing remarks. I do want to thank again our participants for taking time uh, out of their already busy schedules to add one more thing uh, this seminar. I hope that it's very beneficial for people both to hear some practical tips and also just to feel affirmed because this this is a tough job. These are it's a tough job in normal times, and I really hope that people felt uh, seen, heard, affirmed uh, that they're not alone in in the in the things that you have to do and in the burdens of departmental leadership uh, or other types of academic leadership in the age of COVID. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, and we, we wish you that we wish you the best. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye.